Today we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 1. The theme of the book is justification by faith, but we won't get into that good part until later. David got us started in the book of Romans last week, and he got the bright part of the chapter. It's downhill from there, buddy, up until chapter 3, verse 20. It seems Paul first wants to show us how bad we are so that we can realize how good God is. And the book is awesomely, wonderfully amazing once Paul gets done showing us ourselves as we are apart from the righteousness of Jesus. The book of Romans teaches that a man is saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, plus nothing. The book of Galatians teaches that after we're saved, we can do nothing in order to keep ourselves saved. Jesus does the keeping. David mentioned that Martin Luther's favorite books were Romans and Galatians. Martin Luther had been in a confusing religion that taught salvation was earned and that one could never really be sure you'd done enough to make it to heaven. That would not be a peaceful way to live. So apparently Martin Luther decided to quit letting men interpret the Bible for him, and instead he listened to the Holy Spirit, which Jesus said will guide us into all truth and teach us all things, and he will. So I always encourage everyone who listens to me or to anyone who teaches or preaches, don't take our word for it. Check it out with God's word. Let's read Romans 1, verses 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, for therein what? The gospel. For therein the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The righteousness of God, it's seen in the gospel, and we grab hold of that truth by faith. And when we're saved, what we get is the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not our own. It's an awesome thing to think about, and we should think about it more than we do, of what we have in Christ. Paul uses those words, in him, over 70 times in his letters. When God looks at us, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He sees the Holy Spirit in us, not our old natural spirit. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him, Jesus, he made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He took our sin and gave us his righteousness. What a good trade that was. Paul said in Romans 1.17, The just shall live by faith. But the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk 3.4 in my King James Bible says, But the just shall live by his faith. Those under the law lived by their faith and by their righteousness. Ezekiel 18, 21, let me show you. It says, But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed and keep all my statues and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, all his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them he shall die. Now grace has always been a part of the mix when it comes to salvation. If not for the grace of God after the fall of Adam and Eve, God would have just wiped them out and been happy being friends with the animals, and we wouldn't be here. So grace has always been a part of salvation. But under the law, a person was to live by his faith and his righteousness. Jesus changed that. Our faith today is in someone who did the work for us, 
and even the faith by which we receive Christ is a gift from God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that, that what? That faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Wow. Paul shows us where God has brought us from and what he's brought us to in this uh, chapter of Romans 1. So in verse 18 through the rest of the chapter, Paul starts giving a history of the Gentile nation. And in this history, we especially see the period of uh, time where God gave them up in Genesis chapter 6 and again in Genesis chapter 11. Paul wrote to the church in Rome. It was made up of Jews and Gentiles, and he knew that even among them there were some that were lost. So the way he wrote seemed to me to be like, if the shoe fits, wear it. (laughs) Uh, Because I read through the first of this letter, and I thought, wow, who'd want a letter like this? But like I said, it gets better. Romans 1 verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So in verse 18 are people to whom the truth was revealed, but they chose to hold that truth in unrighteousness. They could have had God's righteousness, but they chose to continue on without God. See, the Holy Spirit came and the Holy Spirit left a person in the Old Testament. People have been given the truth. Everyone has been given the truth in some way. Today, people may pass a billboard and see the words, Jesus saves. That could be the first thing that plays on a person's heart that gets him to thinking about God. When any light is accepted from God, God will be sure to give that person more light, but some want none of it. We in the United States are for sure without excuse. The gospel is presented to us everywhere. We can literally hold the truth in our hands and go on in our unrighteousness. It's our choice, the righteousness of God or the wrath of God. But if we have the righteousness of God, we'll never suffer the wrath of God. Jesus took all the wrath of God for sin on himself when he hung on the cross. We'll have our troubles in this world. We'll suffer the consequences of our own sin. But, whew, the wrath of God, that's a whole different thing. I'm teaching in the book of Revelations in a home study. And yeah, the wrath of God, that's a big difference in the troubles we have. In Romans 1, 19 and 20, Paul gives two ways that everyone who has ever lived or ever will live knows of God and his righteousness. One way is through man's conscience and the other is simply by the things we can see. And there's another way I want to mention, and that's by word of mouth in the early history of man. Think about how long people lived back then. Their lives overlapped. Adam lived 930 years. Think of how many people he must have told of how he walked and talked with God and of how wonderful they had it back in the garden. The things taught them by God would have been passed on to others who told others. Adam's son Seth lived 912 years. I'm sure there were other siblings we don't know about because Adam lived 800 years after Seth was born. There was a guy named Enoch later on that came along and he walked with God and God took him. Enoch was raptured. He may have walked with God like Adam and Eve walked with God. He may have been directly taught by God like Adam was. We don't know for sure just how that went down. Then that refresher course would have been passed on to his children who would have told their children and their friends and others. Think how many children all those people must have had during their lengthy lifetimes that was able to pass the truth on. There wasn't anyone who didn't know the truth about God. Enoch's son Methuselah lived longer than anyone and died at 969 years of age. He and his siblings, I'm sure, told everyone about uh, God taking daddy up to heaven alive. Many may have even seen it happen. Methuselah, 
had a son named Lamech. Lamech had a son named Noah. And uh, that explains Noah finding Jesus <laughs> when no one else seemed to know. <laughs> Enoch, his grandfather, had walked with God. That family all probably sat around talking about God all the time. They all knew God, but sad most, well, the others, the others during that time, they did choose to go their own way over God's way. The others held their truth, the truth in unrighteousness. So uh, this right here is a little extra. Enoch was a godly man, and so God took him home before the wrath. Enoch was a picture of Christians being raptured before the wrath of the tribulation because what came next was the wrath of the flood. And he was taken up alive to heaven, escaping God's wrath. So if you'll look when you're doing your Bible reading, we have a Bible filled with pictures and types, object lessons of things to come. Romans 1, 19 through 20 will be our next scripture. Well, no, it won't. Psalms 33 will be. But we're getting to, to that. So God's wrath was revealed through the flood and will be revealed again to those who chose to, to choose to go on in their unrighteousness through the tribulation. Verse 19, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse. In Psalm 33, 14 and 15, speaking of all the inhabitants of the earth, the word says he fashioneth their hearts alike. We all have a conscience. God has manifest himself in our hearts through our conscience. And then we also know there has to be a God by the things he has showed to us. Knowing the difference in right and wrong is something manifest in us all. God put it there. Then when Adam sinned, he died spiritually, and so we were all born in Adam's image with an empty place in our hearts that only God can fill. So we see all he's created, and it makes us look for God, the God behind it all. Romans 2, 14 through 15 and other verses tell us that thousands of Gentiles were saved in the Old Testament even though they had no Ten Commandments written down. Romans 2, 14 through 15, For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, those having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in the their heart. When a man wanted to do right and wanted to know God, God got the truth to him. Some say that you can know a child is coming to the age of accountability when they feel guilt over a thing. I don't know if that's true, but it could be. Um, an example of conscience in the Old Testament would be Abimelech in Genesis 20, who was a pagan, a heathen. He knew to have Abraham's wife Sarah was not right. The heathen, <clears throat> even the heathen, understood God's moral law perfectly. And when they followed their conscience, God gave them mercy and got the truth to them. There are example after example of Gentiles who knew the moral laws of God. God has it written in our hearts. Uh, the captain of the Babylonian guard that was in charge of Jeremiah. He was a pagan. He fully understood Israel was in trouble because they didn't obey God. When a person had the desire to know God, God got the truth to them. Before the written word, he spoke to people, to some people in dreams and visions. The happenings in the book of Job took place before the word of God had been written. Job 33, 15 through 18 says, In a dream and a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men and slumberings upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instruction, 
that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. He keepeth back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. So God has always gotten the truth to people. He could talk to and appear to anyone he wanted to, any time, any place, to Abraham, to Hagar, to Moses, to others. Not only did he appear to godly men, he appeared to ungodly men. What about King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, big time pagan? God came to him in dreams. And, and King Nebuchadnezzar would accept a little truth. Sometimes it seemed like, oh, he's about to become a believer. But then he'd fall back. God kept dealing with him. And finally, it seemed like God quit dealing with him and turned him over to a reprobate mind, which this chapter is going to mention. But even then, Nebuchadnezzar was not without hope. King Nebuchadnezzar ended up getting saved. He was a monument of God's mercy. I believe he still sometimes works through dreams or visions now when a person has the desire to know him and is in a place where there is no Bible available. I've heard of Muslims today being saved that way. Our silly notions limit God and keep us from understanding that if God loved people back then before the word was ever written down and got the truth to them, why wouldn't he do that same thing today for people who don't have God's word available to them like we do? He would. I believe he would. Philip was sent to the Ethiopian eunuch who was searching for the truth. Remember that in Acts 8? Peter was sent to the Gentile Cornelius in Acts 10. Saul, who became our Apostle Paul, had a desire to know God and, and to do right, even though he was doing the most horrible things. He thought he had the truth and was doing right, but uh, he wasn't. But he wanted the truth. He wanted God. So God got the truth to him. He had to knock him down to do it, but he got it to him. <clears throat> so people have seen God, our conscience, through creation, a word of mouth, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse. Even his eternal power and Godhead um, <clears throat> The heat of the sun, the strength of the wind, the waves, the darkness of night, the flash of lightning, the roar of the thunder, the rain and the hail and the snow. Man, that's some power. That's some power, isn't it? We see that power all around us. His power and Godhead are seen in creation. The Godhead is defined in 1 John 5, 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. That's the Godhead, the Trinity. The number seven is said to be the fingerprint of God throughout His Word. And the number three is the imprint of the Godhead packaged into the universe. Practically everything in the universe has three parts to it, which illustrate that our Creator is the three-in-one God. Think about it. You can probably name more. I'll name a few. Well, first of all, man is made up of body, soul, and spirit. A tree has branches, a trunk, leaves, flower, stem, leaves, petal. Primary colors, red, yellow, blue. Primary micronutrients, carbohydrates, proteins, fats. Matter made up of solid, liquid, and gas. Heaven. First, second, third, heaven. Rock, igneous, sedimentary, metamorphic rock. Still rock. Three and one, three kinds. Time, past, present, future. Dimensions, height, width, length. The earth, land, ocean, sky. Fire, made up of heat, fuel, oxygen, atoms, protons, electron, neutron. How many of you have ever taken a blanket out in an open field on a dark night and gazed at the stars? It's a great faith builder. 
after my daddy's death, my faith, my faith was weak. The, the devil will come in those weak times to whisper all kinds of junk to a person which should never listen to him. But I'd go out at night and look at those stars and the moon and the splendor of the night sky, seeing the awesomeness of God's creation. And I would think of how, okay, all this could not have just happened. That helped strengthen my faith to believe in the things that I could not see. The world says seeing is believing, but God wants us to believe in order to see. But even so, the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen if we'll just look. Psalm 19, 1 through 3, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth His handiwork. The voice of the heavens shout. Every morning begins with a miracle. Watch a sunrise. Every evening ends with another miracle. Watch a sunset. Day after day, the invisible things of God are clearly seen. A newborn baby, a, a calf in the field being born. So many things. A flower opening. Not a word is spoken, yet we all hear it loud and clear saying, There is a Creator. There is a God. He has revealed Himself in nature. In his book, Cowboy Boots in Darkest Africa, Dr. Bill Rice tells about preaching to a little tribe of pygmy natives. He spoke to them about how sin and death had come to man through Adam and Eve and how Jesus, the Son of God, had come into the world to save sinners. After several nights of preaching like this, a little old pygmy named Teresa stood up and said, I thought it must be something like that. Many times I've climbed the highest tree and have looked far into the sky trying to see God. I felt sure he must be up there someplace. And again and again I've called, God, are you up there? Can you hear me? Do you see? Little old Teresa, God, I'm afraid. Come and help Teresa. He said, but I could never hear him answer me a word. I thought God surely must have some way of helping poor old Teresa. And I'm glad to hear of Jesus and to know that he died for me. I thought it must have been something like that. God reveals himself first through creation and then through his word. And light accepted brings more light. God gets the truth to those who, who uh, want it. Even if we do have Bibles all around us that we don't pick up. <laughs> my grandson Lou's testimony is on my YouTube channel. He said he didn't even believe in God, but that it was a terrifying thought to lay down at night and know that if he died, he wouldn't be in a good place. He kept praying every night, asking God to, to um, let me see a sign. Let me see a sign. Come to me as a ghost in my room. Let me know it's real. Uh, it was no great miraculous way, it seems to us, no great miracle that God worked to bring Lou the truth. Not the way we think of miracles, but Lou said God answered his prayer in a miraculous way by working it out so that he was in just the right place at just the right time to hear just the right message exactly suited to him that he needed to hear. He wasn't going to go to that youth camp. Somebody called him up the night before and said, Hey, dude, your, your fee's been paid for. You're going. And Lou said, Okay, I guess I'm going. <laughs> well, he went, and his prayers were answered. <laughs> and so were his grandmother's. Romans 1, 21 through 22. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Since the earliest times, people have known of God, but even so, Genesis 6, 5 says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So God eventually gave them up to a reprobate mind, meaning he quit dealing with them, and he let sin have its consequences. Now, the word reprobate never means lost with no chance of salvation. As long as we got breath, we have a chance to be saved. And once we're saved, 
no matter what kind of sin we're living in, we're still saved in the in New Testament times. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar, I think he's a great example of someone being turned over to a reprobate mind. Go back and read his story for seven years. <laughs> he was eating uh, grass like an animal. Uh, if, if ever that was reprobate, that was. <laughs> But in many different ways, in many different times, God has made himself known to man. So man is without excuse. The first step downward is not giving God glory and not being thankful. Not giving God glory and not being thankful. Have you given God any glory today? Have you thanked him for anything yet today? To give God glory would be like to look around at the beauty of creation the landscape, the flowers, that a newborn baby and say, wow, my God did that for me. Isn't he awesome? And then thank him for it. Thank him for it. We would have nothing without God. So the first step downward, not giving God glory, not being thankful. Within two generations after the flood, man was sinking down again, wanting to build a tower to reach heaven and make a name for themselves. They started it, but God stopped it. It was in the land of Shinar at a place called Babel. Romans 1.21 began the description of how the Gentile nations after the flood became corrupted. They were not using their imagination for the glory of God. In Genesis 11.6, God says, Now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. So he gave them all different languages and scattered them from there to all the earth. The light given them by Noah and others had gone out except for a few individual believers among the Gentiles. The majority had turned to idolatry. Romans 1, 23 through 25, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So Baal worship got its start there at Babel, Satan's counterfeit religion. The names of the gods worshipped were changed because the languages were changed. But we can uh, see all the same that the every culture in the world uh, has all those little gods, all those little idols. I heard this week that India has over I think it was three or either 30 million different gods they worship. So the images they bowed to were varieties of the things mentioned in verse 23. Uh, they changed the glory of God into an image of a man. They made God into a little statue, and then they started making other things into little statues, little idols. The idolatry of verses 23 through 25 became universal by Genesis 11 after the scattering. In Genesis 12, God calls Abraham to leave that area, go to a land where he would become the father of a new nation. It's like, get out of that pagan territory and I'm going to send you somewhere. We're going to run the pagans out and start over with a new nation, (laughs) a Jewish nation, who were meant to be the light of the world. Even Abraham's family that he left behind were idol worshipers. By Genesis 18, the corruption of the Gentiles had again reached its extreme with Sodom and Gomorrah. In Romans 1, 26-32, Paul gives a long, long, long list of every kind of sin imaginable. And he says in verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So there comes a time when God will leave a person or a nation alone. Let them have what they want. In Psalm 107 through the whole psalm, it's showing us people 
that God left alone. And then they got to their wit's end and they called upon God. All of this chapter is the history of the Gentile nation living in a time where there was no new birth and no indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It had nothing to do with anything that took place in Paul's day or ours. It's past history that took place before the time of Jesus. And we can see that in the way Paul keeps uh, using the words they and them. So if God left you alone back then in the Old Testament, you were in big, big trouble. If those people died in their sin, they went to hell. Paul is giving us a contrast of the way it was. He's, like I said, eventually going to get to the good stuff, how Jesus came and how that now our righteousness depends on one thing, and that is... Uh, if we have placed our faith on Jesus Christ to be our righteousness. So let me show you the difference before I close. The church at Corinth during Paul's day, some of the members were living like pagans, doing many of the same things listed in Romans 1 and even worse. But we see that in his letter to them, he didn't say, you're going to go to hell for what you're doing. And he didn't say, you need to get saved again for what you're doing. He didn't even say, God's wrath is on you. Uh, the church is now the body of Christ. The church is never going to feel God's wrath. The body of Christ will suffer no more wrath of God. But what Paul did say to the church at Corinth is, don't you know who you are? Don't you know who you are? He was telling them, straighten up and do right. You're a child of God. You got his Holy Spirit in, in you. You're God's temple. And as for the one who was living in a most horrible sin with his father's wife, he told the others in 1 Corinthians 5, 5, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He was telling them, leave the guy alone. Quit praying for him. Let him reap the consequences of his sin so that will bring him back to God. He may suffer in his body, but he will still be saved. His flesh may suffer destruction, but he will be saved. The Holy Spirit today sometimes will stand back Leave us alone. Let us do our own thing. And that is the very worst thing God can do is to leave us alone. But he eventually will if we keep refusing his call so that many times it's going to be our own sin that chastises us and gets us in a fix and drives us back to him. And it's a very, very painful way to go. And it doesn't have to be that way. Just turn back to God. His arms are always open wide, waiting for you. He's always there. He's just not saying nothing. He's not saying, come back, come back, come back. He's left you to a reprobate mind to go your own way. <laughs> and you'll come back. Sooner or later, you'll come back or he'll take you home. We stand to lose a whole lot if we don't stay close to him. Our happiness here, our rewards in heaven, our testimony sometimes our health, and even our life. But we will never, never, never lose our salvation. In Romans 1, 26 through 32, there's a list of sins. And if you read through them, you're going to find yourself there. And that's why in chapter 2, verse 1, Paul starts out with, don't judge them that, that he just talked about in chapter 1, because you're guilty of some of the same things. Right there with homosexuality, Paul mentions liars, being disobedient to parents, proud, envious, whispers, that's gossipers, etc., etc. We're all guilty. Without the righteousness of Jesus Christ, we're all a mess. But it's so easy. It's so easy to be in Christ and have His righteousness. He bled. He died. He arose, paying the price for our sin. And to turn to him in belief as your Savior is what it takes to be saved and to be made righteous. Won't you do it today? I pray you will. 
God bless you.